Thank you. So we will uh, uh, continue with where we stopped yesterday. So this, we are slowly going into the practical aspects of uh, this uh, journey. So yesterday I said that there are eight important angas in what we call traditionally what we call yoga. Although the Bhagavad Gita describes each chapter as a yoga. Um, starting with Arjuna Vishad Yoga to Karm Sanyas Yoga, every chapter is called in yoga, which means yoga is not only what is Ashtanga Yoga, but any direction which we take in exploring the inner understanding or the reality, supreme reality as it is mentioned in Vedanta, is considered in yoga. And I said yesterday that the Gita keeps on repeating that yoga shastra at every chapter. Even in Bhakti Yoga, the end is yoga shastra, Krishna, Arjuna, Sambhadi. So, but right now we are dealing with the practical aspect of uh, traditionally what is considered to be uh, yoga, yoga darsana. Now, among many writers, the most important one who probably systematized the teachings and put them in a certain order was uh, Patanjali. Now, therefore, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are considered to be the textbooks followed by a person who wants to learn what I would call practical yoga. I explained yesterday that it has eight parts and that the aim, as described by Patanjali, is Chitta Vritti Nirodha. <laughs> Accepting the fact that the chitta is not a machine. <laughs> so, uh, chitta vritti nirodha. And for bringing about the stopping of the agitations of the mind, of the chitta, practices are prescribed in the sadhana pada of the Yoga Sutras. Um, so the ultimate is beginning of yoga, not the end of yoga, the beginning of yoga, or rather the tarmac from which we can take off. Uh, Professor Bhupendra has also come. Thank you. So to take off, um, we need a tarmac. So this is Chitta Vritti. Then you have various stages, but you need to have Chitta Vritti first and foremost. And as I said yesterday, the agitated mind cannot reflect and understand the Purusha. This is the theory. So the agitated mind has to be calmed down, cooled down, and for that, the disturbances and the imbalances, which are known as the Vrittis, are to be removed. This is uh, Chitta Vritti. They can be removed in various ways, but in this particular text, Patanjali talks about the yogic way, strictly the traditional way of removing, through music, through devotion, also the vrittis are removed. The, you, look, one thing is certain, you cannot suddenly replace all the vrittis and keep the mind blank. The mind refuses to be blank, like nature refuses to be a vacuum. Try, always air will try to get in, in the same way. So what do you do? Substitute with good vrittis first. There are good and bad vrittis. Substitute with calming vrittis, good vrittis. After some time, the good vrittis overtake the disturbing vrittis. And when this happens, then the good vrittis also finally have to be wound up gradually, if you are aiming to become completely free of it. 
So when that happens, the chitta no longer remains an individual chitta. The chitta can is kind of loses its identity and there is only the purusha. When there is only the purusha, the experience of purusha, understanding of purusha, according to Patanjali, then you realize that there is only one universal purusha. There aren't any other purushas. Although, individually, we all are supposed to be, according to the yoga darsanas, having individual purushas. The essence of our consciousness. When this happens, then there is one purusha. Therefore, the word used in the Yoga Shastras for the stage of ultimate release is not moksha or nirvana. They call it kaivalya. Kaivalya has its root in kevalam only. So in that understanding, there is only the purusha one. This is kaivalya. So then there are no problems. There is only one. The problem begins when there are two. Even at home. So, sorry, I'm joking. Um, so, <laughs> this is what happened. Now, I started with the eight angas, which is yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. The ultimate last is Samadhi. Now, I have to clarify because generally when people die, especially prominent people die, and they put up a, in a grave one stone tablet saying, rest in peace or whatever we write. That's called Samadhi. The other day I was telling the ultimate aim of your Samadhi and somebody said, I don't want to go into Samadhi. I still want to live. So that's not Samadhi. <laughs> According to the Yoga Shastra, Samadhi is the state when the mind is free of all vrittis and it rests in the ultimate Purusha. This is Samadhi. So, <clears throat> yesterday we discussed one or two uh, of the Yama Niyamas. We don't have to go into detail into many, but a few more we need to discuss. We discuss ahimsa and we discuss non-acceptance of gifts. And I said there are various angles to it. We discussed it yesterday. And also like Professor Bupinder said, one has to be skillful in doing these yama niyamas. Otherwise we may end up in more vrittis coming due to reactions. <laughs> right? So, then uh, we go to yama Niyamas, yeah. A few more. One is Saucha. Now this need not be uh, explained at all. Cleanliness. It also means when there is cleanliness, you see today, a long time people even ignored this. Now with COVID, everybody is washing their hands. Everybody is washing their feet. The Jain monks used to wear masks for hundreds and thousands of years. Hundreds of years at least, forget thousand. Today we are all wearing. In Madhnapalli, the Muslim ladies are having the last laugh because they all used to have a mask like now. All the ladies are wearing and they're laughing. What I'm trying to say is that cleanliness, uh, not too much of contact physically, it's not because of any caste system or anything of the kind. It's because there are so many viruses in the air. Today we know this, that there is COVID. There could be anything. And to stay healthy is one step in yoga. Without a healthy body, there cannot be a healthy mind. You cannot meditate, you can do nothing. So that's where asanas also come into the picture to keep the body healthy. So you have a healthy mind. So all these practices of cleanliness at least for some time staying away from others. This is a, a kind of the lockdown that we had. It was an imposed thing because we wanted to be not dying, but living. So physically, I mean. So we had a lockdown. If you go back into history, you'll see lots of yogis 
imposing a voluntary lockdown on themselves. Not because they had any trouble or any problem, but because that it helps in many ways. Mental health, body health. Today, if you lock down people's mental health doesn't improve. It, it becomes worse. Those days, they knew how to use the time to do something else. Transcend the ordinary. Right. So, saucha is easily understood. Cleanliness inside and outside. Inside cleanliness is to keep the mind as much as possible free from being polluted by the influence of others. This is also saucha. I did not know this version of saucha till Maheshwaranath Babaji, my guru, told me, oh, you're clean and all that, physically, fine. But saucha is not over. I said, why, Babaji? He said, because as long as minds and thoughts keep influencing you and changing your behavior, you are still not clean. Many of us think we think independently, but we don't. We are taken along the stream of what others think, not knowing, unknowingly many times. One of the examples is, if on the TV, I keep seeing advertisements. Uh, now liquor advertisements are banned, so there is no problem. But olden days, even now, if I keep seeing every day, two people enjoying in the tub with a soap, and on the side the soap, they keep saying peers, peers, peers. I think I'm watching the show and enjoying it, harmless. What happens is when I go to the supermarket or to the mall, my hand automatically stretches towards peers. Why? Because to be free of that influence is also saucha. Let's say physical saucha right now. So cleanliness. Then there is something called uh, simple living. It's an old saying, simple living, high thinking. Which means if you're too much caught up in the complexities of life, then it is difficult to apply your mind to serious matters. That's all it means. Simple living means. In fact, I know people who have nothing, but who are so caught up with that little bit that they have. There are others like Janaka, who live in a palace but are totally detached. So it's not a question of what you have or what you don't have. The attitude of mind to remain simple. Now, from simplicity comes another um, yama, which is uh, contentment, santosha. The first three, when they are followed to the best extent possible, then the mind learns to remain content and happy. Contentment does not mean Again, what you have and what you don't have. But in some way to draw a line and say beyond this it is not required and remain quiet. Also to remain happy in the midst of all circumstances. Now in the ultimate sense it's called sthita prajna, but it starts with santosha, contentment. There are people who whatever they have are not contented. And the excuse is, no, otherwise, how can we grow if you are content? Actually, if you are content, you can grow better. You don't grow because you want something. You grow because you are expanding your horizons. So, santosha. Then there is one niyama, which is very controversial, especially among the young today, modern world. Brahmacharya. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to understand the word Brahmacharya. Charya means any activity or movement towards Brahma, the supreme reality. So, Brahmacharya, in essence, is any activity or any rules that we follow or any attitude that we follow, which will lead us to the Supreme Brahman. This is Brahmacharya. It's not only physical celibacy. 
Now, physical celibacy had, is advised for monks and so on for various reasons. We'll look into that. But generally, Brahmacharya, because you see, many yogis have also been not totally celibate. All the great rishis who are found in the Upanishadic dialogues, there is not a single monk, not a single unmarried person out there. In fact, the great Yajnavalkya, who appears in the Brihadharanika Upanishad, one of the biggest Upanishads, had two wives. I'm not advocating that for the present, I'm just saying. <laughs> one is enough. Uh, so, uh, this, <laughs> what is it? Yeah, so, uh, in fact, one of the great dialogues of the Brihadharanika Upanishad is between Yajna Valkya and his wife Maitri. Maitri is there anyway. Mm. Yajna Valkya says, I am going off to the forest. To Madhnapalli, somewhere. And Maitri says, I am also coming with you. Mm. And she says, why? Because he says, I am going to discover that. Because of which, we love ourselves. What is it that we love? When the father loves the son, or the wife loves the husband, or the lover loves the lover, or when actually we all are loving only the self, or the satisfaction of the self, we do all this. Extensions. Therefore, the ultimate, uh, in the ultimate analysis, we are all loving only the self. When Yajna Valkya, which is true even ordinarily, we love only ourselves. But here Yajna Valkya is talking about the greater self. When I want to enjoy something, I think I'm enjoying it for myself, but actually I'm going closer. I'm trying to reach that self which is always in enjoyment, which is defined as Satchidananda. We discussed that in the beginning. Ananda aspect of it, happiness. So, that's part of it. Then, physical celibacy also in some way means it's difficult for human beings, especially for us in this situation that we live in, where we are daily bombarded. Sit out for TV, even for serious. Sometimes I go and look for talks in, of some, of Ramana Maharshi or some, video and suddenly there is an ad coming in. I don't know how it comes in YouTube, for instance. The sub arrangement is there. I don't know what happens. Or you go to Google and watch, suddenly there's someone. And it says, this video, the, this will continue after this is over. The ad is over. Of course, you have buttons where you can press and stop the ad. But what I'm trying to say is, in this life that we live, influenced by so many outward circumstances, including so many attractions to the sense organs, it is rather difficult to stay in a celibate state of mind. But why has it been given even this much importance that people say, the yogis say that it is good to control your sense organs? Now here I want to tell you, there is an intimate link between the tongue and your sexual energies. We are not trying to cut off the sexual energies totally, because if you do that, you may end up with various psychological uh, problems. Nowadays, at least, those days are over. So, then you have to see a psychiatrist and he'll say, this is repressed uh, power, what desires and so on. So, Unless and until one has something in mind in which one can emotionally indulge, apart from the ordinary sensory indulgences, it is not possible easily, especially nowadays, to divert or take ourselves away from that. Generally what happens, people are so obsessed with that particular sexual uh, uh, energy that they keep thinking about it all the time, even to stop it, and they are falling more and more into it. 
consider it only as one of the organs, like other organs. Tongue, skin, all our sense organs. This is also just one of them. It's, to take it to be the ultimate is the problem. Otherwise, there is no problem with it. When you understand it as it is in its real sense of the term, where it's placed, what is required. Having said all that, I would say that there is no, there is some reality to this uh, need for controlling your sexual urges. Not to cut them off completely, it's not, not even possible, but to control it to a great extent. Why? According to the theory of Yoga Tantras, Patanjali has not discussed it elaborately because they are sutras. Sutras are aphorisms which need to be elaborated by somebody. Uh, for all human beings like us, apart from food and shelter and a little bit of entertainment, or for those who are spiritually inclined and so on. What is the thing that is the greatest joy? Sex. Unless you have found something which is more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It is sex. In fact, the ultimate uh, uh, I hope I can use this word the whole of the drama of sexual and indulgence and relationships ultimately is the orgasm. Now, when that happens for a split second, you really don't even know where you are, what you're doing, who is what, for a small period of time, infinitesimal maybe, time. You are free of all identities. You are in some kind of state where there is no thought, almost. And it is very enjoyable. This whole drama is for that only, finally. Now, it's a tremendous power. On the physical uh, angle, it's that which finally produces a new human being. Sperm meets the egg and there is a new human being. So it's a creative force. It continues your life because there is continuity when you have a child. One more entity is created, individual. That's one side. On the other, it's a tremendous enjoyment, the like of which there is nothing that we know of in this world. And very often, many of the create, much of the creative literature that we have on love and, and, this, and all these poems and everything stem from this in some way, are related to it. Of course, even in the spiritual sense, it's not physical sex, but there is some, like the Rasalilas. Not physical, it's not that aspect, but something else, which is a little different, but linked. Now the Yoga Tantra say, there is such a tremendous energy in us, which can biologically create a new entity altogether and which is so powerful that you sometimes will do anything to get there. Is it possible to tap that energy and not use it only for your satisfaction in the physical sense of the term, but to be able to sublimate this energy so that it takes you to the upper levels of consciousness, or let me put it, deeper levels of consciousness, upper lower, we don't have to use, inner levels of consciousness. Therefore, being what it is, in these inner levels of consciousness, there is also joy. 
Nobody likes to go into an inner sense of consciousness if you say it's a blank. There's nothing there. But when there is an enjoyment accompanied, then we, our minds get directed. That is the quality of the mind. It seeks enjoyment. So, nothing wrong with that. That's how it's built. It seeks fulfillment. It seeks enjoyment. It seeks to be one together. Even the physical act is two people coming together. Therefore, the yogis say, the Yoga Tantra say, that this energy can be tapped for higher purposes. Since they, you need to tap it for higher purposes, it's good to keep some kind of control over it. Not allow it to run uh, riot. Then the same energy can be sublimated to higher or inner levels of experience. This is where the whole question of uh, Kundalini Yoga and so on and so on comes about. Therefore, the whole science of Patanjali doesn't mention it anywhere in the sutras. Not because he doesn't know about it, but because it's a basic fundamental. Uh, aphorisms, which don't go elaborately into anything. But if you go into the Yoga Tantra, Satchakra Narupana, Kular Navatantra, and various other textbooks, Yoga Pradipika, some people call it Hatha Yoga Pradipika, but it is actually Yoga Pradipika, and so on, you will find a description of an elaborate system of Nadis, uh, inside the human system. This is related to the subject of what we call Brahmacharya. That's what I'm saying. The sublimation of this tremendous uh, creative energy into the inner levels which take you to the greater understanding of multidimensional consciousness. So, and the practices of this are also enjoyable because it stems from what we normally enjoy physically also, which is the root. And this is the science of the energy which is called Kundalini. Please, I've resisted from using this word till now because nowadays this is a word which is bandied about too frequently. Uh, there are magazines which advertise. If you pay 6,000 bucks, in two days, your Kundalini is awakened. I don't know about this because we have worked almost whole life to get something out of this. And if someone tries a quick uh, shortcut, you probably will have to see psychiatrists and so on. So, I think we need to look at this word very carefully. It's not so cheap. Anyway, this energy, again, is supposed to reside in the human body, the human system, at the center, at the end of the spine, called the muladhara. Now, elaborate system of nadis, channels of energy, are described in the, in the Yoga Tantras. If anyone is interested in going into the details of it, I would suggest that the only good book available on the subject, unfortunately, is not by an Indian. It's by Sir Arthur Avalon, who wrote The Serpent Power. It's actually a translation and elaboration of a certain text, Yoga Tantra text called Sat Chakra Nirupana. Shat, not Sat, Sat Chakra Nirupana. So, <clears throat> this energy, it's also called among the Shaktas, a Shakti. The small part of the universal energy of creation which rests in every human being and therefore makes every human being potentially creative, either in the physical way or in the higher sense of the term. And this energy is supposed to rest at the bottom of the spine in the center called Muladhara. Now, if you put a dead body on an anatomy, table and open up, you will find nothing. You will only find a little triangular bone there, of course. 
won't find any petals, lotus, nothing is formed. There is a reason for that, we'll go into that afterwards. Now the system of channels according to the uh, yogic uh, yoga tantras is uh, there are lots of nadis in the system but there are three major ones which is Ida, Pingala and Shushumna. Shushumna is this, what is approximately what we would call the spine. Although it is a subtler energy but it, the space where it exists is almost the same as the spine. Then there is the Ida, which is on the left side, and Pingala on the right. Yeah, for all practical purposes, it is okay for us with the Ida and Pingala functioning. The Sushumna doesn't have much of an activity when one is not moving towards the spiritual realm. This part of the central nervous system, biologically speaking, and the right and left, or the right and left vagus nerves, and the sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which comes from the brain, and some nerves come from the spine, and form plexuses. So you have all these plexuses. It's perhaps these plexuses formed by the various cluster of nerves, which is called the chakras, or approximately the same location. Solar plexus is Manipura Chakra and so on. Um, now for all practical purposes it is enough if the energy is moving, the prana energy is working through the different channels. But for the yogi it is required that it works in the central channel. Now therefore very slowly the yogi begins to uh, expand his consciousness by shifting his awareness from the lowest center of Muladhara to each of the centers up till the Sahasrara, which is in the brain. Okay, so we will not go more into this because we need to again come back to this. But I'm only, I, was, I went off into this because of the word Brahmacharya was explained. So when you control this energy and use it for the purpose of uh, lifting your awareness from the lower center to the higher centers, then it is uh, necessary that you have some kind of, some amount of control over this. And this control also distinguishes the human being from the animal. While the human being has a capacity to indulge in sexual acts at any time in the year, it's also necessary and responsible for the human being by, for being able to control it when required. Animals have no problem like that. Like in September, October, November, December, you'll see lots of dogs outside. It is the season. They have no control over it. They indulge. But when the season is over, they stopped. It's built in the brain. We have been given the freedom to offer it when we want. So. It's better to use it responsibly. We are not just dogs. I like dogs, please. I'm not degrading them in any way. I'm only saying I also have dogs. It's sometimes they're better than human beings in many ways. They love you. They give them one time food and they'll never forget you. Uh, not like, unfortunately, they're some, not all human beings, give them food once and they begin to guess, where did this fellow's food come from? Maybe I should acquire that. Anyway, so, <clears throat> um, so a certain responsibility is required in indulgence of any kind. Let's put it this way, a definition from <laughs> Brahmacharya. Certain amount of rational control over things, essential. So let's not now stay with the Amaniyamas. There are only 15 minutes now. Let's, I hope you don't mind my going a little elaborately. Into, this was the fun, actually the need for doing. Uh, um, then uh, comes Yamaniyama Asana. Now, I told you yesterday that according to Patanjali, the only asana he mentions is Thirasukham Asana. But again, it's a sutra, so you can't go elaborately into it. 
If you want to understand the number of asanas that are practiced traditionally from the beginning, not only in the, the Hindu system of thought, but if you include Buddhism and Jainism, they're all part of the system. Uh, in fact, as I said yesterday, the Jains don't have a deity like they worship Mahavira and the Tirthankaras. That is, the human need to consider something as divine. But they don't have a, a, any creator or anybody of that kind. And yet, the Jains have done a lot of research on yoga. I didn't know that till fairly recently because I didn't know much about the Jain field. And I studied it because in the United States, I was asked to address a Jain gathering in New York. I said, look, I do I don't have much background about the Jain, whatever you, so what should I talk about? They said, there's one thing, which our, one of our teachers is also here, one of the Munis, he would like to suggest that you talk on Ashtanga Yoga. So, what I'm trying to say is, even if there is no theology connected to that, Ashtanga Yoga is a very important subject, even for the Jains. As far as the Buddhists are concerned, well, what is the most popular posture that you see today? Yogis may or may not sit in Padmasana. The Buddha is always in Padmasana. It's an asana, believe me. Buddha is always in Padmasana. And, he's, and in images, we see he sits very comfortably. Uh, why I am saying this is if it's discomfort, gives you discomfort, then it's not asana, according to Patanjali. So you need to start training from a young age to be able to sit in Padmasana. Why Padmasana? It has various factors involved in it. Yeah, okay, as we are on the subject. I said that among the Nadis, there is Ida and there is Pingala and Shushumna. If you see how the Padmasana posture takes place, uh, the one heel is on the left and the other heel is on the right. Now, you have to be very careful because the complete Padmasana actually is to cross your hands behind and then hold the legs which are sitting like this. But generally we keep our hands in front like this and sit. Now that posture I'm saying, because if you do too much of that, pulling the heel towards the body, there's a possibility of hernia developing. Uh, I'm saying this because I went through it. Mm, mm, because always pressure. But on one side it is good because the Ida and the Pingala are stopped. So don't think yoga is only a metaphysical or it's very practical and physical also. It's a link between the physical and that which is not physical. As I as we discussed yesterday, our emotions are also in great way chemical in many ways because of the hormones. So when the Padmasana, when the heel closes the Ida Pingala, then only the Shushumna is open to function. So the energy travels through that. Okay. So now, if you need to know about asanas, which asanas, what asanas, where to start, I suggest that the traditional textbook on that is uh, written by uh, Swatma Rama, who belongs to Nata Sampradaya. And it is called the Yoga Pradipika. Some people call it Hatha Yoga Pradipika. It describes over 82 asanas, postures. Now, are postures important? Yes, from the meditation point of view, you need to have a posture where you are balanced and comfortable. Yes, apart from that. Are asanas important? Yes, because their asanas are not for building muscle. Although in the process, muscles do become steady. Asanas are to keep the body supple and not only supple but also to influence the endocrine system of ductless glands. Many asanas have that. Where you apply a little bit pressure, 
on the particular glands through the posture. Plus, it's also uh, the asanas, there are many asanas which either are this way or this way. Which means what? It keeps the spine supple. Supple and steady spine is essential for the practice because the main roots of energy, the main uh, uh, R-O-U-T-E roots, energy traveling, are in the spine. So, a yogi is not a spineless wreck. He is, to use an expression, he has a steady spine, he says. And uh, it's, nowadays we sit so much in chairs, that uh, many of us have spinal problems because the, the spine has lost its the muscles around there have lost the capacity to support our body because we always lean. Anyone who from youth sits steady and becomes uh, rock steady, uh, so to have a state uh, spine is very important in yogic practice. Of course, if you can't, you can lead, that's a different matter. But I'm saying, this is the idea. If the spine is balanced, then it sets everything in balance. Therefore, many of the asanas, including Mahamudra, are to massage the spine and also to keep it supple, S-U-P-P-L-E, supple, this way and that way. Then some of the postures are to do with particular pressure on certain endocrine glands, like the Matsyasana. I don't know if you know Matsyasana, it is like, I don't think we can demonstrate on the table, but Matsyasana is to sit in Padmasana and fall backwards and hold the toes with your hands. Matsyasana. It looks like a fish of Matsyasana. Masyasana has, apart from other things, the physical uh, uh, capacity to massage your um, adren ad uh, adrenal glands, which are somewhere here. There are various asanas which are to massage the kidney and so on. So, the body and the circulatory system and the nervous system and the pathways of prana he properly irrigated and exercised and steady. So you can sit and stand up with a steady spine. Some of the... Now, we cannot also not mention the fact that there are asanas or postures which are topsy-turvy, where the head is down and the legs are up. Sirsasana, Sarvangasana, and so on. Sarvangasana means it helps all the angas of the body. Sirsasana means you headstand. I am not saying that to go to the higher levels of yoga, you should be practicing all the asanas. That's not what I am saying. There are great people who have never done any asanas except the Sukhasana of sitting in a comfortable posture. Agreed. However, many of them seem to have at some point practiced some asanas. Proof, Mahavira. What posture, apart from standing, does Mahavira sit in? Which posture does the Tirthankara sit in? Although they have not discussed asanas much. What posture does the Buddha sit so comfortably in? In fact, so much so that it's called in the West the Buddha pose now. It's a balanced pause. Uh, one good thing about the Padmasana, don't do it too vigorously and pull the heels towards and so on, is if you sit in Padmasana, there is a possibility that when you explore the consciousness inside, awareness inside, you might fall into a trance state, T-R-A-N-C-E, trance state. Now, if you sit in a posture where you can fall front or back while you are in that then it is danger. If you sit in Padmasana, there is no chance of the body, even when it is not consciously aware of itself, of falling backwards or forwards. 
because it's all fixed. There is a stand-like thing created with legs. You may go this way a little bit or go a little bit, but you will not fall down. So there are many reasons why asanas are basic, of course, keep your health good and start with simple asanas and slowly proceed. Don't say that I need to do Padmasana to meditate because otherwise it will not work. If you start at the age of, say, 30, 40, to try and do Padmasana with twist your legs, God forbid, they become so entangled that you're not able to take it off. Apart from that, it becomes, you get only knee pain and discomfort. So it cannot be an asana. Sthira Sukham Asana. So, these are some of the aspects we have looked into of the postures which are called asanas. Okay, so head down stand, what is the uh, function? Most of the time, we human beings, especially because we are one of the species that always walks upright, which is good of course, we are not on all fours, upright. Uh, we, and some of us are so swollen headed that we will not bow down to anybody or anything. Huh? We consider it terrible to bow down to somebody. In fact, somebody told me I don't go to temples, not because I don't like it, because what happens if boss sees me going to the temple? You go there, you have to bow down and so on. I'm not saying you should bow down to me. All I'm trying to say is, we, we are proud of that, I don't bow down, uh, head is always straight, which means that the circulation of blood in this part of the area is very limited for most human beings. So the upside down posture brings about good circulation here. I'm not saying that you should always bow down when you're recording and all that, that's not what I'm saying. So when you... Uh, Put your head down and legs up. There's a lot of blood flow into the system. And we all know that this is the most important part of this whole system, controlling factor. So it's always good to irrigate it with good blood circulation. This is one of the importance of head down. But warning, if you have a high blood pressure, don't do any topsy-turvy postures. Don't do any asana where the head is down because it might end up in a brain hemorrhage, actually. I don't know if you know this, but Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru used to do Shirsasana every day till the very end of his life, I think. He had a brain hemorrhage. It may not be because of this or that, but he also had high blood pressure, I think which is evident from certain ways. Um, watch out when you do this carefully. Um, so these are some of the discussions we had on the asanas. In the ne it's already six. In the next session tomorrow, oh, we will a little bit wind up on this and then go on to uh, pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharna. We have how many more sessions? Only one. We'll see what we can do. Otherwise, we can have another couple of sessions later after I come back from Delhi and so on. So it's not something which we can fix, you know, like. But anyway, so thank you very much. So we have a, a half an hour of uh, interaction session now. Do you have any questions on this? Pranam uh, thank you. Today you were taking us um, a little uh, on the practice side by advising what to, how to start if we have not started or how to connect with various things. But I'm somehow looking forward to the ultimate, you know, like take us to a point where we can perhaps have a shortcut or a, or a quicker <laughs> <laughs> way to get to the essence, you know, which you pointed out in the first lecture, which is such a like, can, can we somehow, with your experience, can, can you give us a direction where we can jump 
a few <laughs> steps sir uh, the problem is this shortcut thing you know like there are no shortcuts that way of course there is one shortcut which is a very difficult shortcut it is to cut the ego into two but uh, it's not possible so easily for us to do human beings we have our own i understand there is no shortcut but i am not saying implying that you should go through all the ashtanga yoga as asana pranayama pratyahara and so on to touch that i am not saying that uh, like for instance if i think you are more on to the jnana marga now in jnana marga when you go into the upanishads and so on there is not much discussion on uh, um, the practices like uh, pranayama although in some places like the highest authority we know today shankara has uh, said that if you cannot do the vichara of trying to find out your inner reality go within who are you what is your identity like the upanishad then it's possible to also do a little bit of nadi shuddhi which is breathing in and out simple breathing in and out uh, nadi shuddhi so that your mind is purified of the uh, disturbances and then is possible for you to go in even the ramana maharshi has said that if you cannot sit down if i can't you are saying find out who you are uh how can i my mind is he said if you can't do anything else watch your breath <laughs> so such things are there of course but you can't call even that a shortcut there is no sh- it's not a shortcut in the sense that one does nothing and reaches there that big quantum jump but even if you do all the yogic ashtanga yoga teachings yoga tantras and so on if your aim is not to take that quantum jump then it is useless this is to be noted carefully i shouldn't say oh i am a great yoga acharya i can stand on my head for ten hours so what nothing happens you are still the same human being that aspect we should not forget we should stress the understand that all that you do is ultimately to go deep within and find the true self which is pure consciousness all these are only helpful having said that i should also add that in this world different human beings are in different levels of maturity and different levels of understanding everybody need not go through everything to that some people might have be in, might be on the threshold all they need is a little snap of the fingers but this idea of wanting to get there should be an earnest and sincere desire rather than the laziness of wanting to go through the process this is also should be clear i mean if you are taking the yogic process i personally would say that yogic process is good because it also takes care of your you need not do 84 asanas i mean that that's not good a few poses and like i said bowing down you one need not publicly go and bow down to anybody not required actually i am also not very fond of that uh, but in close the doors of your own room go down to the earth which gives us food which gives us sustenance in private bow down a few times touch your head to the ground it helps it also gives you a feeling of thankfulness which is very important the spiritual field so all these are there so there are no shortcuts somebody said the, sh- the shortest cut is to find out who you are but it is a long thing i mean it's not so easy for most people so all these are preparatory and as i said just now different people are in different levels of evolution and therefore for some they have they are on the threshold they need to have just one snap and then they're there if you ask me such people may exist do exist 
but if since we don't know about their past lives uh we don't even believe about past lives many of us so we don't know where that started from and ended here in this life especially so in child geniuses like from childhood some people are oriented toward the spiritual and they get an experience much early in life and so on which is not that there is following some kind of unfair shortcut all their cuts have happened and now is the point when they have come to that threshold from which they can leap for instance many people tell me ramana maharshi did not have a guru so it's fine okay are you ramana maharshi <laughs> ramana maharshi did not have a guru but he did not accept disciples but many people look upon him as a guru as a teacher in fact physically is no more there are some people who have a picture and they say he's smiling at me and so on pictures don't smile it's a belief system <laughs> faith and even let, though, let me let me say it differently uh, shreem then you are on the top of a mountain let's say i'm i'm assuming that you have uh, gone through many many experiments to reach a certain level of uh, a spiritual understanding yes, and sir. you can see many of us at different places mm. perhaps you can see the paths that are more suitable in in the current uh, scenario like you pointed out so many bombardment of ads so many demands socially um, professionally and at the same time the quest for something more more kind of uh, stable and um, you know the word you used i don't have a better word than that satchitanand like you know people want to be in the stability of uh, continuous joy unconditionally maybe you can see what all is more appropriate because <laughs> so professor now this becomes very individual you know and this is a general talk general discussion now for that is why i believe that a personal contact is very essential in these matters if you have a personal contact one on one with people it is not possible to this path is also not a mass thing if somebody says there is only one way it's very simple do this you let in moksha i don't think this spiritual path is a mass phenomenon it's a very individual approach today we don't have time for all that generally so it becomes we go and join whatever we feel is good for us is fine but it's very individual those days in the uh, forest academies people live together with the teacher each individual was assessed in different ways that's a satsang actually and then what is to be followed you will see that the same rishi has two or three students and they are all different their approaches may be different but they are all aiming at the same thing so in this matter yes so while general satsangs uh, and interactions like this are very essential especially among the youth because at least they have food for thought there may be something in it so um, i would say that this individual uh, link is important for movement today it's not possible for students to come and spend all the days with the teacher and so on in many ways but even then when you get to little movements little moments when you are together with someone then you assess not only assess where they stand and how they should go or where they should go it also depends on your interaction when you say sadhu satsang it simply means you meet sadhus and then you decide what is my approach to this problem i may not have the same approach as somebody else the other thing i would like to say is if a person has touched that suppose suppose somebody has made a quantum leap suppose very often not very often many times it happens that the person is not able to communicate even what has happened to others 
part of this. The other is, even if someone has, suppose somebody has, and that's that which we are seeking, let's say that we are seeking. Even if that person doesn't utter a word or speak, if you sit with that person for some time, maybe just have a cup of tea and do nothing, after a while you realize that something is happening to us. I can't tangibly explain it in physical dimensions. What's happening is, there is a, what the psychologists or what the hypnotists call en rapport. En, it's a French word, en rapport, which means rapport with each other. My uh, mind waves and the other person's mind waves have somehow, for some reason, come to the same frequency. When this happens, things happen even without words, even without saying anything, even by just having a cup of tea. There's a change happening inside. This is also there, the other aspect of it. Since you started the subject, uh, uh, sir, that uh, was shortcut. <laughs> I think well, actually I meant this not really the shortcut, but like I know, you know, I know. most, most I efficient. Uh, I would say that the most important thing is an intense desire to find it. No matter which way you're going or which path you're taking, the intense I want to tell you a story. We have little time. Hmm. There was a student and a disciple. I'm sorry, a uh, guru and a disciple. And the disciple was with the guru for 13 years, doing various things. And then at the end of 13 years, they were going for a walk and he said, Sir, I've been here 13 years. Something is happening, but I have not, you know, touched that ultimate truth for which I am earning. And the teacher said, are you really earning for that so badly? Yes, sir, with all my life. How strongly? He said, I can't. Then they had reached a river, a pond. So the master said, let's go into the pond, walk into the pond. So they walked in, when they halfway inside water, the teacher caught the student's head and pushed it in. For a few minutes, the student thought, I have asked an inconvenient question, I think he's going to finish me off. <laughs> and then he was struggling to breathe. And he was about to die, he let go. And the fellow took his head out, and took a few deep breaths and said, Master, what? Why did you do this? He said, you know, when you were dying, you thought you were dying. And how much did you earn for one breath of fresh air? When that much of earning comes to you, you didn't, don't even need me. You would have found it. Of course, this is an extreme story. Okay. Now I'll tell you a milder story from the Zen. Uh, not Zen actually, beyond Zen. Let's say the uh, Dzogchen. The Tibetans have, I learned all this because Babaji said all kinds of people will come to you, so you, you otherwise who is it? Anyway, so um, there is a particular uh, uh, Tibetan system which comes from the earliest Tibetan teachings, the Nyingmas, uh, the first uh, sect of uh, Tibetan Buddhists, started by the great Padma Sambhava. Uh, they're called the yellow hats, the Nyingmapas. In them, among them, there is one particular section called Dzogchen. Now, the Dzogchen, it's, if, it's Z, but begins with D, if you write in English. Stress on Z, Dzogchen. Dzogchen teachings are supposed to be, like you said, instantaneous, quantum jumps. <laughs> That's why I'm coming to that. One side, of course, is the earning, the other. Now, 
one day uh, Dzogchen teach. In fact, they say that the reincarn. You know, in the Tibetan Buddhist, there is always this reincarnation business going on. So they say the Dzogchen Rinpoche who is reincarnated is now living in. He's uh, called the Dzogchen Rinpoche. He lives in a place near Coimbatore in the south called Satyamangala. They have a monastery there. He lives there. He's a married man. When you say Lama in the Tibetan text, it doesn't mean a celibate only. Lama means a holy man. So, uh, a Dzogchen teacher and his student were going for a walk. Again, student complained like the previous student, sir. So many years has been with you, but I haven't had the Dzogchen experience. Instantaneous. Illumination. I have not had. So what is the use of me going with you? Just see what... The, uh, so he said, Okay. You see that hill there? Hmm. You see the sack there? Gunny bag. Yes. Take that gunny bag and fill it with all the brick bats and the rocks that are lying there. Fill it full. Disciple thought, you know, Dzogchen masters are supposed to be eccentric, so you don't know what to do. Okay, he said, I'll do it. So he filled everything inside. Filled it. Put it on his shoulders. And then the master said, First of all, it was so heavy. Keep it on the shoulder. And the said, climb that hill. Here is the hill. Go up. She said, Master, this is very heavy. He said, that's what I wanted to do. You said to find Zokchen, you'll do anything you want. <laughs> okay, here you are. Carry this big sack with all the stones right up the top of the hill. So, panting and breathing hard, the man somehow managed to climb with it on his shoulders. He reached the top. There was nothing in that hill, barren hill, except a tree in the middle, big branches, perhaps a banyan tree. Now the master was riding a horse, so he rode the horse and came up, and he was waiting for him there. This guy went with all this tension, pain, reached there, tired. He said, Master, when, are you, when am I supposed to take away this load, please? He said, throw it off. So he threw away the load. He was so tired, he forgot about Master Horse, went and sat under the tree in the shade, took a deep breath. Said, I found it, Master. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hope you understand what I mean. Basically, the throwing away all the burdens. And the Master said, This is Zen. I'm sorry, this is Zokchen. What were you looking for? Is it something outside you or inside you or up above the heavens? What were you looking for? Now, when you are free of all, pain, tension, everything that's happened, you realize there is something in you which is inherent, independent, and full of peace. This is Dzogchen. So, I'm just looking at it for your question through various angles. Thank you. That was profound. That was profound. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, my question is, the... Um... You have spoken about it, the sublimation of a sexual energy. As well Say as that well. again. Like you have spoken about the sublimation of a sexual energy. Yes. As well as the moments of a thoughtlessness um, experienced during the sexual intercourse. So, 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 is it, so my question is, is there any way, is there a way 
to sublimate this very desire of enjoying sexual gratification completely into higher joy yes but it's not meant for everybody that's called that's called the there is a tantric approach to this which has its own pitfalls one has to be very careful one because generally what happens instead of rising higher just one stays there and doesn't do anything more than that so then it becomes useless but uh, there is a way of doing it which we cannot discuss here um basically to understand that the experience that comes as an orgasm when thought has ceased for some time for a short period of time can also be induced even when there is no sexual act but unfortunately what happens mostly people who try to go that way end up not going anywhere but staying there because of the human nature there is therefore there are some tantras which work on this but uh, it has to be studied very carefully with the right kind of teacher and otherwise tantra becomes just just sexual orgies orgies that's not what is intended it is to explain to define tantra tantra is bhogo yogayate is the definition which means yoga through bhoga which means to understand that all bhoga ultimately is to find the inner satchidananda that is the meaning not that you should keep on doing bhoga to become a yogi that's not what it means it means even bhoga can be utilized by the yogi to transcend it unfortunately most people don't transcend it they get stuck there that is the danger i am not a teacher of, on that particular subject so i cannot give you a practical uh, instruction on that but there is a possibility be careful but sir my question was that uh, in the path of his spiritual progress whether the belief system function as the factor or the yogic practice function as the factor because i have seen many people who does not practice even any type of yoga but their belief system and their work and their activity leads them to feel higher satisfaction and many people who have been practicing yoga asana and many other things but they still remain the same so what does the factor affect whether that is the belief system or the yogic practices that was my question ah good question actually both are important however i would say it i wouldn't call it a belief system i would rather say that following certain principles and having this innate understanding that there is something beyond which we cannot grasp ordinarily the whole practice of yoga is intended for that but normally what happens today nowadays when people practice yoga it can be either for health purposes or it can be just a satisfaction or it may be to win a yogic contest or something like that so that yoga becomes just a physical factor and does not transcend the physical and go to the higher levels of understanding right so therefore that example which you told the people who practice yoga but they are not spirit yes i understand there are many all the hero heroines in hollywood practice yoga are they spiritual <laughs> as spiritus in the evening but not spiritual mm. so uh um so that is true so even if you practice yoga and all these matters the idea is if you don't have your mind fixed on finding the truth i think this is what you meant by religious system uh because religion is not just the practices but religiosity which means the innate feeling that there is something beyond ordinary which is divine and which we need to touch it now there may be some persons who are who know this 
who are convinced of this, who may not be practicing the ordinary yoga which we are talking about. But the very fact that their minds are moving towards that is yoga for them. One small baby appeared behind Shurbi and ran off just now. Mm. So, my eyes see this, that, everything. Uh, so, this, therefore you are right. So, if you ask me which is more important, I would say that, which is the religiosity. Not, not, what you, not, not the word you used. I would rather say religiosity, which is the feeling of awe, that there is something beyond which we need to touch. And devotion to that also, possibly. Right? And thankfulness and so on. I think that is more important. But that doesn't mean that yoga should be cut off from that. And when I say yoga, it need not necessarily mean Ashtanga Yoga and Asanas and so on. The Gita describes every approach as a yoga. And one of the chapters is Bhakti Yoga, Sankhya and so on and so forth. So I hope I have kind of answered your question. Ankit. Yes, ma'am. We have three minutes. Can we wind up now? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. In fact, I am learning a lot in this. <laughs> at the end of it, when all the sessions are over, I am hoping the IIT Delhi will give me also some certificate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Thank you.